All right, I want to welcome our folks at 230 locations nationally that are watching this live stream from Omaha, Nebraska as part of the National Forum on Cover Crops and Soil Health. And I'm very pleased to not only welcome you to this forum, but we look forward to gathering your ideas at each of these locations across the country. We have all 50 states represented for these national forums and several of our island protectorates. So I know our facilitators will be gathering your ideas following the conclusion of this live stream broadcast and a discussion at each location. And we'll appreciate getting those ideas. They'll be entered into a website and we'll be collecting those uh, for discussion here at the conference. It's my pleasure to an introduce the chief of NRCS, Jason Weller. Uh, Jason oversees many different conservation programs in the U.S. and many different hardworking staff with the agency. So without further ado, Jason Weller. Thank you, Jason. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Jason Weller. I have the honor of serving as the 15th Chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's my privilege today to help start and launch this conference, both here in Omaha, Nebraska, but also to our colleagues from across the nation in all 50 states at over 230 locations, literally across from Maine all the way to Guam and the Pacific Basin and from Alaska to Puerto Rico. It's really important that not just the professionals we have here, the farmers, ranchers, but also the conservationists and researchers and academics and advocates for soil health and cover crops that we have here today, it's really crucial, more importantly, in fact, that we're reaching out to those colleagues, those farmers and producers and conservationists across the country, get them engaged in dialogue about what soil health and cover crops mean in their communities, on their operations, in their farming systems, and their soils. So I really congratulate uh, Howard, Howard W., on your vision and leadership, Rob, and your vision and leadership. Jim, thank you for the Soil and Water Conservation Society and your support, the Howard G. Buffer Foundation for making this conference possible, um, and also, of course, my colleagues at USDA and NIFA and NRCS who are here and supporting this behind the scenes and making this possible. I'm extremely excited. This is one of the most important conferences, in my view, that's occurred not just this year, but in recent, uh, my memory at least, in terms of advancing not just the cause of conservation, but also really about the productivity of agriculture here in the United States. Um, but before I continue, we actually have a, a brief video that Deputy Secretary uh, Krista Hardin, many of you may know personally, professionally, has prepared on behalf of Secretary Tom Vilsack. She has a video message for us here on the importance of conservation and soil health. So let's listen to Deputy Secretary Hardin. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to kick off the National Conference on Cover Crops and Soil Health. I wish I could be with you in person, but unfortunately my schedule kept me in Washington today. First, let me extend my appreciation to Howard Buffett, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, and Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education for hosting this important conference. I'd also like to recognize my former USDA colleague, John Burge, and my friend, Alan Weber, for their many contributions to agriculture and this conference. And a big thank you to everyone in Omaha and the thousands of folks joining us through the more than 200 local soil health forums today. It cannot be understated. The issues that have brought us together are real. They need our attention and they need it now. We know that improving our nation's soil health is key to feeding the more than 9 billion people who will be showing up for dinner by 2050. And we're learning these practices don't just improve soil quality, water quality, and air quality, they also can improve a farmer's bottom line. So in this way, improving soil health can be a key component to improving the farm economy, particularly in times of extreme weather. Today, we're seeing more extreme weather events than ever before, more severe droughts and flooding and storms. The practices we are encouraging through the adoption of soil health management systems can help make farms and ranches more resilient to these extreme weather conditions. No doubt, there'll be other challenges that lay before us, and as part of this national conference, you'll be helping to identify those challenges and how we can best overcome them. Because if the cover crop and soil health effort is truly to succeed, we need your experience, your ideas, and your talent. We need you to do what you do best, solve problems, whether you're a farmer, a researcher, a business professional, or a local, state, or federal government employee. Healthy soils are the foundation of the healthy, profitable farms 
which lead to healthy local communities and growing rural economies. And because we all eat, we're all connected to the soil. I want you to know that USDA is committed to supporting the cover crop and soil health effort. We're grateful for your dedication to this cause. Together, let's tell the world that it's time we stop treating our soil like dirt and start treating it like our future depends on it. Because you know what? Our future really does depend on it. I look forward to hearing your recommendations. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Hardin. And she, had, just in two minutes, I think encapsulated and more than anything that I could actually say in the next 10 minutes. As you know, she's been a consummate leader, not just in agriculture, an advocate for producers across the country in her whole career, but also a real conservationist to the core. And she really, I think, encapsulated, in essence, the importance of soil health and what this means to the Department of Agriculture. And I know it's her view, Secretary Tom Vilsack's view, but also my personal view as Chief of NRCS. Let me just say up front that our investment as a, as a community and as a movement not just at NRCS, but all of us here in the room and across the nation, is one of the most important things in terms of conservation we have underway right now at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so it's so vital that we're here then today to talk about and learn from each other about how do we advance this cause. So we, we, she talked a little bit about, uh, Secretary Hardin did, about the, the coming challenges that many of you already know in the coming decades, the next 40 to 50 years, an additional 2 billion people we need to feed, the need to enhance productivity on our acres, by an additional 70% where we are today. Many of you already know, though, we have to enhance that productivity on a shrinking land base. We're losing many of our best soils to development. Many of you already know that just over the past 30 years, we've lost 43 million acres of our cultural land to development. That's a land area equivalent size to the state of Washington. And out of that 43 million acres, 14 million acres of that are our prime soils, the best soils in the world. 14 million acres, land area equivalent size to the state of West Virginia, gone. Secretary Hardin already also talked about uh, extreme weather, a changing climate, extreme drought just two years ago that blanketed most of the United States, a historic drought again in my home state of California, but also uh, throughout the West, again this year, intervening these droughts, preceding these droughts, extreme weather events in terms of in including floods. And so this weather variability is a challenge not just for communities, but of course for farmers and producers. So we have increased demand, we have less land, and we have more extreme weather. One of the best tools we have to help manage through that, to ensure the long-term economic vitality and success of our farmers and ranchers, are soil health management systems. And that's really what is so crucial then. We help take the knowledge that you all have and impart that and share that across the landscape so that producers have access to this technology, these practices, and this approach. Bear with me here for a second. Let me just step back and talk a little, get a little philosophical with you guys. Um, the Aboriginal Australians actually have a creation story about where the universe and Earth came from. And before there was Earth, there was this place they called an epoch called Dreamtime. And when the ancestors emerged into the Dreamtime, they found the landscape perfectly flat, black, formless plain. And as those ancestors first started to take their first steps, their feet broke through the crust of the earth. And life emerged from the earth and blanketed the landscape. Life flowed across and converted that black non-place into a vibrant, living earth. Those Aboriginal Australians understood millions, of, you know, thousands of years ago what we understand today is that life flows from the soil. And that's what this conference is about is helping to advance our understanding of the science of soil, the practice of advancing soil health, and ensuring that for generations and decades to come, we can maintain the vitality and life-giving properties of the soils. Uh, of course, you all are practitioners of soil health. You understand kind of the four basic tenets of a soil health management system. Many of you know Ray as a consummate advocate and a passionate proselytizer in soil health, and he talks about the four tenets about Minimizing the soil disturbance, keeping the soil covered, energizing the soil with the plant diversity, and uh, maximizing the living roots to feed the biota in the soil. Many of you already understand what these practices, the best, one of the core practices of that is the use of cover crops, which covers those four tenets, literally and figuratively. Many of you already understand that through those good practices and approaches for soil health, you're actually what the best outcomes you can get is increasing the organic matter in the soil. And that organic matter can hold 18 to 20 times its weight in water holding capacity. 
So just a 1% increase in the organic matter in the first top six inches of soil profile can hold upwards of 27,000 gallons of water per acre. You're going to hear from uh, producers, pioneer producers today throughout the, the next couple days who have been using and pioneering these soil health management practices over the last several years, even decades, and they have literally transformed their soils. They have increased their organic matter in their soils upwards of three, even four percent. Imagine the water holding capacity those soils have, and no wonder they're able to better withstand drought and extreme weather. But beyond the additional benefits of water holding capacity in, in, in helping to produce even through dry times, it's the enhanced nutrient efficiency and cycling efficiency, being more efficient with your nutrient applications. It's about uh, providing wildlife habitat through cover crops, protecting air quality, of course, improving the water quality that leaves those fields. And of course, we heard earlier from Rob then too about both the, the economic and agronomic benefits of cover crops and their use. At NRCS, it, it has been not just something the last couple years we've talked about, it's been from the first chief, Hugh Hammond Bennett, and by the way, Hugh Hammond would be so proud that we finally arrived where he was literally 100 years ago, that we're here sharing and imparting and embracing the knowledge in, in his message. And at our agency, this has been a, an 80-year journey, and it's one that is, we've accelerated, and as long as I'm chief, we're going to ensure our foot is mashed on an accelerator. We're here to advance soil health, we're here to support this effort, we're here to do all we can from the scientific side as well as the investment side, the practice incentive side, but also providing the technical assistance across our 2,900 field offices to ensure that whoever walks through a field office door has, that we have the basic support to ensure they can start their journey on soil health. We also need partners, and there are consummate professionals here represented from universities, land-grant universities, philanthropic organizations, foundations, nonprofit organizations, we're all in this together, and we all need each other to make this successful and to advance this at the scale that's needed for not just the producers, but for our nation. And so as long as I'm chief, I'm committed to ensure that we continue to build upon and expand upon the soil health campaign that you have all launched and, and started, and we hope to be an important partner in this effort as we advance this approach, for not just for managing the soils, but for ensuring the productivity across the nation. At this conference, we're going to be hearing from pioneers, uh, from farmers who have been pioneers in this for years, if not decades, and we're going to be able to have them share and impart with all of us here in the room, but also those out in the, in the country, what their experience has been, their trials and tribulations, but also, more importantly, their successes. We're going to hear from cutting-edge researchers about what their understanding is and how they're advancing the science and the understanding of the agronomics and economics of soil health. We're going to be able to engage directly and personally with leaders in our cultural industry and understand how we can better partner together to really push and advance soil health management systems and cover crop use. But really, this is a catalyst, and I really, of course, my personal hope, but I know it's the vision and hope of Howard and Rob and others here today, that this serves as an accelerant that then we can take and advance out the use of cover crops and soil health. So instead of just certain regions of the country, certain pockets within states, that this is now then pushed out at a scale that really is on a continental level, that we can see no matter what state you're in. Looking kind of through the history of the U.S., in my view, there are sort of two key ingredients that have led to our American exceptionalism and why we're great as a nation. One, it's been throughout our history the economic use of our abundant natural resources. But just as important, another really important engine for our, our ingenuity and our success is tapping into the unparalleled ingenuity and innovation that is the DNA of America. And that's what this is today. We're talking about harnessing those two great engine, uh, engines of American ingenuity and greatness, the economic and wise use of our abundant natural resources, coupled with advancing ingenuity and innovation. I'd like to close out with a quote from the first chief, Hugh Hammond Bennett, which I think is particularly poignant. He wrote, in this democracy, national action to conserve soil must be generated by these millions of land users. If they are active and willing participants in such a movement, it will survive and will endure. Otherwise, it will fail. He understood that, of course, managing the soils produce an abundant array of benefits, but in the heart of that, what he was talking about is people. And yes, we'll be talking a lot about today, about different cultivating practices and about different soil crop mixes and cocktails of seeds and other things, but never lose sight what we're talking about are people about families, about operations, about communities. That's what this is about. 
And so I'll leave you with this question and this charge. When we're done here today and tomorrow, when we return back to our jobs and to our operations and our lives, what will you, what will we do to help support these millions of landowners, these farmers and ranchers, so that they can be willing and active participants in the soil health movement? Thank you very much, and I wish you very uh, much for a, a successful and exciting conference. So we're going to be transitioning to the next phase of our uh, inviting the panelists up. And as well as the panelists come up, we're actually going to be watching a video from one of our panelists, from Ray Gesser, who is an Iowa no-till farmer, I understand, Ray, but also a president of the American Soybean Association. So as the panelists come up, we're going to be watching Ray and understanding a little bit of his experience in soil health. My name is Ray Gasser. Uh, we've been farming here in southwest Iowa since 1978. Our history here has been, uh, you know, we've been no-tilling almost everything uh, for the last 30 years. Uh, and we think it's really important to maintain the soil, you know, to build up organic matter. Uh, and, and we were been really, I, I think, successful at controlling erosion and, and building that organic matter on our soils for, for almost 30 years. But in the last several years, uh, you know, we've had such severe rain events and, and you know, three or four inches in an hour or, or eight to ten inches of rain overnight. And, and our, our conservation practices, our no-till, our waterways, our terraces just aren't enough to handle those kind of events. Our goal is to have a cover crop on every acre, you know, but that might be five years down the road uh, because it's just a learning process for us now. You know, it's, it's going to take more time in the farm. About 6,000 acres total. Uh, uh, about 1,200 this year's cover crops. Uh, we started three years ago with 200 acres of cover crops. Last year we did about 1,000 acres and this year we're 1,200. Uh, we're trying to learn as we go to see what works best. So in this particular field is, is cereal rye and it was planted uh, 10 days ago. So in one week uh, it, it was already up and growing and, and that's the advantage that we see in our climate here in Iowa uh, because we have a limited amount of growth between harvest and, and the time we freeze up. Uh, we need something that's pretty aggressive, we think. The main benefit, the main concern for us today is, is conservation and erosion control, but you know, we see uh, you know, the ability to maybe build up on our soil health, and there, you know, those are the advantages that we see uh, you know, down the road as we do uh, continuous cover crops every year. We think we will build the soil health and, and make, it, you know, make our yields of our soybeans and corns even better down the road. I, I believe that, uh, I think it's something that is really going to grow because I do believe that there will, that we will find there's lots of benefits to cover crops uh, in addition to erosion control, nutrient sequestration, you know, the, the soil health things. You know, we do care about the land here on our farm and we're concerned about it and we want to do the best job that we can to maintain the, the health of the soil, to maintain the soil that's in place. All those I think we'll, uh, we'll find lots of benefits. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, in the wonderful world of technology, I understand our live stream uh, audience needs to reload their browser. So just click on uh, restart or reload your browser and it should recontinue your live stream. And while they're doing that for our audience here in Omaha, I want to remind you to be writing some questions on note cards. And we've got a couple people going through the audience to pick those up. Uh, if we could, uh, Debbie, if you could help with that. We'll have uh, some folks here picking up the note cards and bringing those forward in a minute, questions for our panel. So I want to reintroduce uh, myself. I'm Rob Myers with the USDA SARE program and the University of Missouri. You've already met NRCS Chief Jason Wellard. Thank you, Jason, for those great remarks. I want to introduce our other two panelists. Uh, Ray, you just met on the video, but Ray Gasser yeah, from you. American Soybean Association and a farmer here in Iowa, and also Howard G. Buffett. Uh, Howard is a farmer as well. And, uh, Illinois, not too far from where I grew up on the farm, and uh, as well as a philanthropist that has done a lot to help conservation efforts in the U.S. and around the world. So welcome, gentlemen, to our panel this morning. 
Our format for the next 30 minutes or so is uh, to have a conversation here among the folks on the stage about these issues of cover crops and soil health. Uh, again, you've got the opportunity to ask some questions on note cards. Uh, those will be brought forward and brought on stage in a few minutes here. But I wanted to start just with a few questions. So Ray, we'll start with you since you're next to me here. Sure. On your video, you talked about how you've been a long time no-till user. And yet with these more severe rainfall events, like I, we saw uh, that it's been a challenge to keep the soil in place on your farm. So how has using cover crops helped with that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we started no-tilling uh, really in the early 80s, but 100% since about 1991 on our farm. And, you know, we were rolling along for about 20 years there with, uh, you know, no erosion. You know, we were, we were constantly building more terraces and, and adding waterways and turn areas and those kind of things. And, you know, it was working really good. And then uh, starting in about 2010, we started having these severe rain events, you know, uh, that we'd have, as I said on the, on the video, three or four inches of rain in an hour, or eight or 10 inches in a day or overnight. And, and our structures and, and our terraces and our waterways and, and no-till couldn't handle that. We were floating. We were floating the residue up off the soil with, with four inches of rain in an hour. Uh, so uh, we just thought we needed to do something, and we started testing note uh, cover crops, and, and, and in particular at, at our farm by our house in 2011, uh, we had that four-inch rain in an hour there, and where we had our covers, we had no erosion, and we, where we had no-till, we still had a little bit of erosion there. So, so you know, it, uh, it really makes me as a farmer, and, and I think all of us, uh, believe that we need to do something more and I think cover crops is one of the answers for 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 the you know the severe events that we're having. I have a friend who's a climatologist and and he's been telling me for a long time that this period, you know, I don't care if you call it climate change or what you call it, but he said this would be Mother Nature's fun house and just extreme events. So uh, we're preparing for that on our farm and, and and we want to grow more and more and you know we're gonna double our our cover crop acres this next fall. Great. So, and Howard, I know you've been using cover crops for at least a few years now. What made you start using cover crops on your farm in Illinois? Well, I might just back up and talk about how I started no-tilling, because if I weren't no-tilling, I probably wouldn't be using cover crops. And um, it, it, it's a funny thing that I say to people, I mean, a lot of people here wouldn't understand it, but if you're talking to, to someone who doesn't have experience in farming, and they ask you, why do you no-till? And I said, well, you know, I actually wanted to learn how to farm closer to nature and they'd, they'd laugh at that because I'm in this 400 horsepower tractor and you know I and and which I'm not giving up and and uh, so you know the, the point is nature does some amazing things nature does things man cannot do destructively and also in positive ways so you know when I had the opportunity um, to start thinking about changing my system when I moved from Nebraska to Illinois um, it was actually easier for me because I was, I was starting over again in terms of what I was going to do. So I looked at my investment and I, and I thought about how am I going to do this in a way that does allow me to use nature to the benefit of my production system. And so I started no-tilling and then about five years ago I started using cover crops. And, um, and you know, it, that's a learning experience. It's a management issue. Uh, the very first year I used them I got uh, I got done picking corn in a couple of fields, got an airplane, came to Omaha for a Lindsay board meeting, and I landed in Omaha and I thought, I could have been, somebody could have been drilling cover crops, I, and I lost five days, which is a big deal in the fall in Illinois. And I got home and I was like making phone calls. And so anyway, you know, um, cover crops to me are just the next natural step to trying to um, have a broader system. And I think the biggest single issue we have as farmers in this country is we don't farm with a system in mind and we still aren't there we're a long ways from there so you can talk about your production in terms of strip till or no till or whatever uh, cover crops nutrient management water management all the things you know how he how he has done a lot on our water management on our farm here with irrigation but you know we still don't think in terms of systems and until we really get that right we won't reach the point where we are uh, the best that we can be Jason, I know we've got farmers like Ray that are using cover crops without necessarily needing uh, financial incentives or, or going that route, but yet we have a new farm bill and uh, we have some new things in there like conservation compliance. So how do you see conservation compliance or other parts of the farm bill fitting into cover crops and soil health? Well, first, let me just 
acknowledge that we have a new farm bill. I think this is a big <laughs> success. So I'd like to, yeah, all right. Uh, three years in the making, uh, it's a big success. My congratulations uh, to Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow and Chairman Frank Lucas of the House and Senate Agriculture Committees um, and for seeing this through for their perseverance and leadership to make this possible. Um, and now at USDA, under the leadership of Secretary Tom Vilsack and Krista Hardin, we're very excited to get rolling with the new Farm Bill. Um, as part of that Farm Bill, we have a very strong conservation title. And I think that's a real testament to folks in this room, for farmers and ranchers across the country, but also for conservationists who advocate for the need for investments, whether they're technical assistance investments or financial investments, incentives for producers to experiment or implement conservation systems in their operations. Um, we have a very strong conservation title. Uh, which I think is, again, a testament to the professionalism of folks in this room, of my colleagues at NRCS, as well as the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. We've proven that conservation isn't just something nice to have in an operation, it's something that's part and parcel of a successful farm or ranch. And that the wise stewardship of your resources can really help you be economically successful year to year, generation to generation. Um, regarding specifically to conservation compliance, let me be absolutely clear, nothing changed in terms of how we apply compliance. Nothing changed in the law. What the new Farm Bill does is recouples crop insurance benefits prospectively going forward with conservation compliance. So what this means is uh, for folks with HEL high, highly erodible lands, you have to have some good conservation practices in place to protect those soils. Or if you have wetlands, the, the swamp buster provisions are in place to protect those wetlands. Um, how NRCS administers that responsibility will not change at all. If anything, we're only trying to improve and enhance our approach and to ensure that, of course, we're, we're kind of caught here in this responsibility. Yes, we have to both advocate for and protect those resources, but it's also our responsibility to help those producers be wise stewards and also get a fair deal and a fair shake in terms of the compliance responsibilities. So NRCS, we're very focused on ensuring consistency and timeliness of our compliance, but in terms of specific, specifically what's gonna change in compliance, nothing's gonna change in compliance. But in fact, many of the practices we're talking about today uh, in terms of a soil health management system and the use of cover crops are part and parcel to protecting those vulnerable soils. So folks who are using a soil health management system who are using cover crops will, will, will be in compliance, will help protect those HAL lands. Thank you, that helps me understand it a lot better. I appreciate that. Now Ray, you've been a leader in both the Iowa and the National Soybean Association. Our first audience question is actually, the Iowa Soybean Association has been a long leader in conservation. How do you see ASA, the American Soybean Association, being a leader in the commodity community in cover crops and soil health going sure. forward? Yeah, and Rob, as, as it said, you know, Iowa soybeans, and I've worked with them a lot on our farm, and, and it's really made a difference for us because we do on-farm testing and, you know, testing practices that, that we can prove that either works or don't work and, you know, improve our operation, whether it's the amount of nutrients we use or, or the covers that we use. And, and ASA, you know, our role is policy, and, and we help with the Farm Bill, and we help with, with conservation programs and those kind of things. And ASA is also, you know, uh, promoting conservation. We have an award every year that I have the honor of giving out about a week from today uh, to, uh, to a conservation winner of the, in the United States. And, you know, it's, um, it's, it's uh, supported by a lot of our industry, and, and it's a great honor for those people to receive those awards and to be acknowledged, you know, for the good conservation and work that they're doing. Sounds great. Howard, this next question is going to be for you coming from the audience. Uh, the question pertains to the fact that farmers have often been the leaders in trying new practices with cover crops and soil health. And the question is about, from the audience, uh, how do we best incorporate some of this valuable in-field or on-farm evidence of some of these improvements, and then do the research on small plots or large plots uh, to better understand this from a scientific standpoint? You're funding some of those projects. How do, we, how do we benefit from the progress the farmers are making? Well, I think, you know, earlier somebody, uh, oh, Jason was talking about how the bottom line is that it's about people. And um, I think our biggest challenge is uh, the mindset of many farmers. You know, you do something for years the same way you watch your dad do it, your grandfather uh, do it uh, certain ways. It's hard to change behavior. Um, and so, you know, a few years ago we started this harvesting potential campaign and we have, and most of the guys participating at Dwayne, Dan, Mike, you know, they're, they're all here uh, as the expert gurus 
Um, I saw Dan come in and I said, well, the gurus are here. And he started looking around trying to figure out where they were, but he's one of them. And, uh, and, and Dwayne and Mike are unbelievable. And, and they're all involved in this. And that's what we have to do is we have to raise the profile of farmers who are having success. We have to raise the profile of those individuals who understand the processes, the challenges, but the solutions. And so, you know, one of the things we've tried to do in partnership uh, with yourselves is, is raise that profile. And, you know, the one nice thing about, about farmers is most of them are still, at least a part of them are old school. So you can, you can, you can get to farmers through a, a media channel that's a lot, still remains fairly easy. I mean, you know, they pick up, uh, you know, Farm Journal and Farm Futures and, and, and uh, Successful Farm. They pick up a lot of magazines and um, even though that's changing, you can still have a pretty good avenue as to how to attack the problem through uh, media channels and reach a lot of farmers. The question is, how does that translate to behavioral change? We, we don't have that figured out. Um, so that's, that is a question that I don't think any of us can really answer today. But I, our effort is if we are able to have the right partners, um, put out the right information, uh, it's huge. And I'm not just saying it because Ray's sitting here, but it's huge to have someone in leadership positions that are actually doing what we need to have done. And so, you know, we just entered a new partnership with the National Corn Growers Association, which we think will be very helpful in spreading the word. So a lot of it is advocacy. Well, I think we, we have the knowledge uh, although we have a lot more to learn, but we, we have plenty of base knowledge to understand why we should do something. You put slides up there that, you know, are, are factual, that, 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 that should convince anybody to do it. And on top of it, you're saving fuel, you're saving hours on machinery, you're doing all these, you can farm more acres if that's what you want to do. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to it. So, you know, when it comes down to it, and there's a lot of things in society similar. I mean, it was like trying to get people to wear seatbelts or people to stop smoking. Or I mean, you know, changing human behavior is the most difficult thing there is to do. So I think, you know, having a strong advocacy campaign, having the right partners, um, it's inc for me, it's very exciting to see the USDA this engaged and to see Jason this passionate. And, you know, um, uh, Wayne, you know, who is totally committed uh, in yourself to this. So I think as that builds, that is what's going to take to really make big change in this country. Well, speaking of USDA, I'm going to give the next question back to Jason. So one of our audience questions is about CRP, and the specific question is just, uh, as we count cover crop acreage, does Conservation Reserve Program uh, ground really count as a cover crop? That's a specific question, but I want to broaden it a bit, too, to it looks like we're going to have maybe less financial support for the total Conservation Reserve Program acreage. So as we have some ground continuing to come out of CRP, do you see uh, cover crops or other soil health practices coming into the picture there? Uh, well, let me just be, be clear at the outset, for, especially for my colleagues at the Farm Service Agency, uh, NRCS does not administer CRP, uh, but we help support the, their administration of the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, does CRP acreage count as a cover crop? Well, there is, con there is conservation cover on those lands, so I guess in part it does count, but it's not, as you know, a land in production. Right. Um, the soils, though, that have been covered, we would surmise probably are pretty healthy that are coming out. And so then we do have then incentives in uh, program assistance, both again, the technical assistance and the financial assistance through programs such as the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the Conservation Stewardship Program, and others. Where we're actually very focused, and the new Farm Bill also focuses on this, is this transition. So as acres come out of their CRP contracts, as they come out of that long-term cover, come back into a working agricultural landscape, whether that's into a livestock operation, we have that into a pasture or range operation, or into row crop production, uh, we do have practices, and that would be the best time actually to, to get in line and to help those producers start practicing and implementing those soil health management systems, whether it's a cover crop rotation, whether it's different um, no-till or low-till conservation tillage approaches, as well as other conservation practices to help facilitate that transition from a CRP cover into a working row crop system. And Jason, I'll just stay with you with the next question. You just alluded to how some of these conservation programs are partnerships between NRCS and other agencies, such as the Farm Service Agency. The next question is actually about the Risk Management Agency. And the question is about, uh, is there an opportunity for NRCS to work more with the Risk Management Agency in the future on tying uh, crop insurance together with conservation <laughs> practices? Um, such as giving a soil health rating that may pertain to crop insurance or other things. So if you could speculate on that opportunity. 
Well, I need, I was, I was talking with Ray at the beginning, uh, we need to be very careful what we say here today because we could inadvertently either cause a bull run or a crash in the, the seed market or in this case, crop insurance industry. Um, so yes, I, I guess I will speculate. Uh, so first and foremost, under the leadership of Dr. Wayne Honeycutt and his team, as well as our national agronomist, who's here, Norm Widman, and our, you know, a lot of team uh, at, within NRCS worked with their colleagues at the Risk Management Agency. And in very short order, they did something unprecedented, particularly within USDA, is within a matter of months, they put together um, a new policy for how we can better integrate uh, crop insurance products with cover crops and the use of cover crops. And so we now have, for the first time, a national approach, which is a very more simplified approach to how you can better integrate your use of cover crops with crop insurance products. And yes, there are still some things that need to be, some kinks that need to be ironed out, but this is a big first step that we've taken together with NRCS and RMA. And my hat's off to our colleagues at RMA, some of them may be here today, and Brandon Willis, who's the administrator of RMA, and his team, their leadership, they really took a, a leap of faith. And at the end of the day, what Brandon Willis said is if the experts on soil and the experts on cover crops say this is okay, we at RMA should trust them in that. And that's pretty, that's a pretty big deal, yes. And so while I understand it's not yet perfect, uh, and we may never achieve perfect, it's a big, big first step. And I want to acknowledge that leap of faith in that risk that RMA is taking in sort of, not, not crop insurance risk, but in terms of a policy risk, I should be careful here with my words. In terms of though, uh, Howard, in, in terms of what you were saying earlier about ways to advance uh, soil health use and cover crop use, of course, yes, it's, it's advocacy, but also I think what you're getting at, Rob, is also then is, is market signals. So the two coupled together, the advocacy side, but also then signaling in the marketplace, cover crop use is a good thing. And that may be, some are advocating through crop insurance products, that if a producer is using cover crops and we can show actuarially, scientifically, economically, that use of cover crops reduces your risk of crop loss, can maintain and protect, even enhance yield. Me personally, not speaking for an, as an RMA administrator. I think we got that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be careful because I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, that, may, that should maybe be reflected in your premium. We, we've got the disclaimers rolling on the screen <laughs> under your picture. Yeah. <laughs> I may still get the policy when I get home. We'll uh, so Howard, I've got a very specific question for you. This one from the audience is, do you plant any of your cover crops into your standing corn or soybeans? Oh, absolutely, because we no-till. So, um, and when you're talking about the economics, one of, one of the things I kind of calculated, uh, and I'm gonna do this by memory, now, but you know, we used to always use uh, to, to have a really clean system going into the spring to plant. We would always use a, uh, a chemical um, on both our corn and soybean ground. I won't mention them by name, but um, but um, they, you know, that would give us a great advantage going into that rather than trying to go with the burn down. So, what we did was we eliminated the use of the chemical in the fall and replace it with the, the cover crop. And so it, it, I would, so I give myself that, that economic um, calculate, I give that, that as part of the economic equation. So when we get all done um, with our cover crops, typically I would say it might have cost us two to three dollars an acre more to put the cover crops in at, on a net basis. Well two to three dollars is nothing compared to the advantages you're gonna get from those cover crops. And of course, one of the things, we, I mean, everybody, we're in central Illinois, so, you know, if we were in Minnesota or something, we'd have other challenges, but it depends on where we're at. And Howie flies his cover crops on, and he's had mixed results with that. We always drill them in, in Illinois, and we would literally, you know, with the technology, I mean, the technology that's available today just helps everybody do better in a lot of ways. But it even helps, you know, like in cover crops, what we do is we'll go in, when we're two thirds done picking corn, um, we'll put the drill in the field and, you know, because we have Swath Pro and, and mapping, we just simply save the end rows for last and basically when we're pretty much done picking corn in that field, that drill's caught up to us and then we just move, you know, to the next field. Um, in fact, there's a few guys in the audience, Daniel and others, who have helped me get it done, but, um, you know, it does, it does take planning um, and it takes the right tools. I mean, I've seen guys try no-till and strip-till uh, with the wrong tools and then they think that the system doesn't work, 
but it's because the equipment was wrong or because one year we had bad timing. Um, and so there's nothing that d drives me crazy more than somebody says, well, I tried no-till one year and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. What have you ever tried in one year? I mean, try telling your wife, I tried marriage one year and it didn't work. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean it, it just, you know, what have you ever tried in one year that, that just says, okay, that's it? You know, I mean, we have to be more committed to this. We really have to be more committed to this. This is, uh, I, I come, you know, I come from the conservation side, from the back door. I spent a lot of years in the 80s and early 90s traveling around the world looking at conservation programs that we funded in other parts of the world. And I've seen firsthand the suffering, the land degradation, the impact of bad behavior, bad decision making. Most of that because people didn't have choices. We have choices in this country. We have the knowledge, we have the support, and we have choices. We need to be the leader. We should be the leadership on a global basis in this area. And we haven't done it. We haven't done it. We're working towards that, but we haven't done it. And just to pick up on that for a minute, obviously you and your team provide a lot of leadership on conservation in the U.S. How do you see what we're doing here in the U.S. tying into conservation efforts worldwide? All right. Well, first, as Howard said, we, we need to get our arms around the science of soil health and cover crop use and also the economics of this before we start proselytizing and trying to share this knowledge and park this elsewhere. Does that, um, do I have to wait? No, no. <laughs> you're already doing a good job getting that out there. But I, I think from, at least from an NRCS standpoint, and we're, we're starting to really get our arms around that and, and get a better understanding of it. Um, but before we preach, we need to practice. And uh, I think that's where we're starting with today is really advancing that practice. You bet. <coughs> well, the next question is actually a practice one. One of the audience members was interested, Ray, in knowing how you seed your cover crops. Do you fly mm -hmm. them on or use a grain drill? So, so mm -hmm. on our farm, we do we do a little bit of both. We we try the airplane, and but uh, most of it we concentrate. Uh, we use an air drill, and we follow, as you said, right behind the combine as quickly as possible and get it in. So we have as much opportunity to grow as possible. Uh, some years the plane works good. You know, if we get a rain after after we've uh, flown it on uh, it works pretty good uh, some years like this year um, you know it was pretty spotty because we didn't get that enough rainfall to really get it to uh, to emerge uh, so uh, you know it's a, a learning process and I think on our farm we're going to uh, have the seed available to apply some of it with the plane uh, to help us you know with the timeliness and get that growth as large as possibly before it frees up but it's going to depend on the weather and we'll we'll look at the forecast and if it looks good we'll put some on with the plane you but bet. Rob, while you're sitting here and all your friends from the usda have to say how he flies them on because he has a time restriction in a stewardship program some of those dates don't work too well um, so you know that's a challenge is figuring out um, how do you combine the practicality of what you have to do on the farm with um, the rules and regulations that exist and, and how much flexibility can you build into that? Because that, that's a real issue. I mean, you've got this incredible program, honestly, that encourages uh, people, and particularly young farmers, to do a better job of water management and conservation practices, but, but they're boxed in on some of these things where it's difficult to do it the way that the best practice might be in that particular area. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think maybe to add to that, you know, when I talk to friends in the city, they don't, they don't realize that farmer, farming isn't a, it is not a factory, you know. <laughs> we live by Mother Nature, and Mother Nature doesn't always, you know, play by the rules, so we have to adapt to those things. Well, Jason, it, it is a challenge for us to keep up with, as these far farmers are fasting, uh, innovating faster than we can keep up with research and policy and so on. So how do you look at handling that as we go forward, you know, just trying to keep up with the different approaches being used by farmers in different parts of the country? Well, I think that's what's so exciting about this, is it, it, a lot of times, a lot of approaches on conservation practices we've tried in the past, it really has been trying to push that proverbial rope. And in this time, this is an example where a lot, at NRCS, we're actually trying to sprint to keep pace with farmers. Mm -hmm. And farmers have been experimenting and pioneering on this approach now for years, if not decades. And we're finally just starting to, to realize, whoa, we're being left way behind. It's time to get move out. Um, so that's what's great, is that we're now energized and focused and on that path forward. Uh, but to take the, the broad experience that there isn't just one size fits all, that, there, that we need to be more flexible and more tailored, site specific, I mean, one of the tenets of my agency is, is locally-led conservation. They've got to be locally-led soil health and cover crop use. 
Um, and that's what's so important then is that we're tapping into the 230 offices around the country today and we're, in, we're starting to encourage those conversations farmer to farmer, conservationist to conservationist, to start to impart that knowledge at the local field level, the local county level, to share their experiences, their trials, but also their successes that then they can share whether you're in Maine or in California or Washington or Mississippi, how is soil health and the use of cover crops working in your communities, in your state? That's the best way to, for it to work. It's not going to be necessarily out of a rural regulation that we can write in Washington, D.C. Well, gentlemen, we've got about three minutes left. Uh, Howard, I wanted to ask you a little broader picture question. I know you and your efforts with your foundation, but also personally talk to a lot of other farmers that are considering adopting some of these practices. What do you see as maybe two or three major challenges in, in getting more adoption of cover crops and soil health practices going forward? Well, the first challenge is get past having them mad at me. If, I, if they think <laughs> I'm telling them they're not doing it, I try to not say, you know, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. But, but uh, you know, um, farmers like anybody else can get defensive about how they're doing things. So I think the approach is really important. I mean, how you approach it. Um, and I would say that even on a larger scale. I would say this country has done an amazing job uh, in the last 20, 30, 40 years of increasing productivity. Uh, we have supported, through that productivity, we have been the most generous supporter of food assistance and saved millions of lives. So we look at that and we have to feel good about that, okay? But just because we feel good, as my son would say, doesn't mean we can't do better. And so we have to do better, and we have to be willing, and that means as people, as farmers, as individuals, you have to be willing to accept the fact that we can do better, and then we have to have that discussion. So I think you have to get past that, that mode of thinking that because we can do better doesn't mean we haven't done well. We've done great, and, but, but let's do better because we can do it, and we can do it better than anybody in the world, and, and that is a fact, and so we should be doing that. So I think the first thing is how you have the discussion. The second thing is, to help people through, help farmers understand the economic benefits um, and the fact that th there is a reason to do this. It's not, it's not a feel-good reason. It's not because the USDA is telling me to do it. It's not because, you know, it's because um, there's real benefit to it. Uh, and, 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 you know, as Jason's saying, we need that scientific-based evidence, and we need the things that can prove to those who are going to challenge us on it, no, we're, we, we know that we're right, and here's why we're right. Um, the other thing is, we, and, and I think it's really good Jason made this point, because we, we've got to take the action and the knowledge and transfer it into policy. Um, we have some great programs in the Farm Bill, but they're real small programs, and they're the last ones to get funded or the first ones to lose the money. And they're the most important parts of the Farm Bill. We think as farmers, we think globally when it comes to how do we increase exports, how do we sell more commodities, how do we do this, how do we do that. We're thinking globally. We want everybody to buy our stuff. But we're not thinking globally in terms of the impact that we're having. Um, and you know we, we, we have skirted hypoxia issues in Mexico for years. One of these days, the EPA is going to show up. There's a few of them here. They're going to show up and they're going to say, they're going to say, okay, we've had enough. You're going to look like Chesapeake Bay, or you're going to look like something else. And we're going to deal with that. So I think the most important message to farmers is we have an opportunity to change this the way we want to change it. We have an opportunity to change this in a way that we can make it fit into our system and do it the way we want and maintain flexibility. Um, Regulation doesn't give you all those op, op, you know, opportunities or options. So um, I think we're either going to face it um, with a big stick or we're going to face it by fixing it ourselves. And if we can just get that message through to enough people, it is coming. I mean, we are not going to be able to avoid, ask the guys, and you know some of them well, in Chesapeake Bay. You know, they avoided something for a long time. You know, the day came, daily load limits. We, we will find the same thing in the Midwest. I mean, we are not going to be able to avoid it. So the question is, do we want to control it and do it in a way that works for us? Or do we want to find out that someone's going to tell us this is the way you're going to do it and we're going to be really frustrated and angry about it, I guarantee you. Well, I know Ray's been a leader in taking voluntary efforts in this area. And uh, so Jason, I, I'll give you the last word here. We've got about one minute left. Uh, you lead a lot of voluntary efforts with technical assistance to farmers all across the country. Of course, there are incentive opportunities to help them try cover crops and soil health practices, but uh, closing words from you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I just would like to echo what, what Howard was laying out here, uh, and it, stepping back a little bit philosophically again, it, relieving, I think in this generation or maybe the preceding generation, relieving a time period in American history, we had a period of, of abundance. We had 
all the land we could use, all the soils we could use, all the water we could use. And we're now moving into an epic that will probably be with us for the rest of our history, which is an epic of scarcity, of competition. And there are parts of the country that have already felt this, but we're now seeing this, this scarcity and competition throughout the US and throughout the world. And so decisions we make today, decisions that we make on our family operations, our family farms and ranches that we can help support in communities really have long-term shadows and long-term payout and dividends. And if we're wise in making the investments and imparting that knowledge today, the benefits that our children and our children's children will reap will be abundant. If we don't choose to take, seize that future ourselves and really lead out, I think the future is going to be more scarce, more burdensome, more regulatory perhaps, uh, and a greater economic burden, not just to the family farms and to the economic vitality in rural America, but really to the long-term quality of life in our country. So this is a really important effort we have underway today. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate you being here. We will now uh, move to the next phase of our program, which is a video of the four farmers who are going to be on the next panel. It'll play for about nine minutes. So if we can have that started by our AV pokes, you'll see some great stories from these farmers as they prepare to come on stage. Cover crops is, uh, is an interesting story. We had a professor friend who needed a place to do some research, and she asked if we had a field that we would, uh, you know, let her put some cover crops in and, and uh, so forth. And and my dad had had some negative experiences with cover crops back in the 80s, and so we weren't terribly interested in cover crops. But we agreed to do it, uh, you know, for her because she helped us on some other fronts. So um, we started to seed annual ryegrass didn't really pay that close of attention until uh, it was the first week in April and the ryegrass that year was probably eight inches tall, maybe a little bigger, and I was out fixing a tile hole and I dug a hole down to, to get to the tile to fix the hole and as I was down in the trench, uh, I could see roots down four feet deep. And that was kind of the aha moment. I know that if, if we add up the benefits, if we look at uh, where we've improved, uh, one of the first farms we bought, uh, we doubled the organic matter. We've gone from 2% to 4%. That 2% that organic matter gives us 60 more units of N a year. At current market rates of nitrogen values, that's uh, at 50 cents a unit, that's $30 an acre per year. That same 2% of organic matter is capable of holding about 16,000 gallons of water per percentage, so 32,000 gallons of water, and that's only in the top 12 inches. We hope we're creating this uh, phenomenon even deeper in the soil, but we're, all these numbers I'm talking about are just in the top 12 inches, uh, so they could be higher. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that's equivalent to an inch and a quarter rainfall event that we get in August after it quits raining that our neighbor doesn't. Our cover crop uh, plan, uh, or, or the reason why we want to cover crop, is a long-term viewpoint that um, the sun is our free resource, and that any time we have sunshine, we want something green and growing and putting carbon into the soil, back into the soil, as we try to rebuild our organic matter back to what it once was. Uh, if I can retire someday or, or look out across the farm and, and see that we've returned uh, soil organic matter to close to equilibrium for this area, I'd be thrilled to death. Hello, my name is Dave Brandt. Uh, we farm in Fairfield County, 1,250 acres of continuous no-till 
corn, soybeans, and wheat. We also have 100% under cover each fall when uh, harvest season's over. And behind is our new uh, purchase of uh, air seeder. And what we do with it, we go in standing corn and soybeans and sow our cover crops about 30 days before harvest. That way we have a 30 day window of uh, growth before we take the crop off. And when we take the crop off, our cover crops come right up and are going. Uh, I think it's a wise investment. We've tried to use uh, an airplane to do aerial seedings and have not quite been as successful as I'd like to see it. Uh, we're working real diligently with uh, uh, blends of six, eight, and 10-way blends. Directly behind me is a 10-way blend. And what we're doing here with this is we're, we're using it to loosen the soils, to build organic matter. Uh, we're, we're presently looking at about 22,000 pounds of biomass, which will increase our organic matter here in this plot about three quarters of 1%. The reason we're using so many is we'd like to have what I call a community working together. We have all the plants doing their thing. We have the tall species that tend to uh, terminate themselves when the, soil, when the air temperature is 34 degrees and then the smaller plants like the winter peas and the radishes and the crimson clover and the hairy vetch will grow clear in and sometimes survive all winter long. So this way we get lots of diversity and we have the soil covered about 360 days a year. On this farm, we lose less than 100 pounds of soil per year because of our cover crops. That's been a benefit to us. The biggest benefit we're seeing from planting cover crops is the regeneration of our soils. When we first purchased this operation in 1991, our soil organic matter levels were 1.7 to 1.9 percent. Infiltration rate on precipitation was a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. Today, because of 20 plus years of zero till, because of a very diverse crop rotation, the use of cover crops and the integration of livestock, our soil organic matter levels are now 5.3 to 6.1 percent and our infiltration rate is over eight inches of rainfall per hour. Every acre of our cropland, and we have approximately 2,000 acres of cropland, either has a cover crop growing before the cash crop, after the cash crop, or with the cash crop. But our goal is to have a living root in the ground as long as possible, feeding that soil biology. What we've done on our operation now is we haven't used synthetic fertilizer since 2008. We use no fungicides, no pesticides. We are using one herbicide pass approximately every two to three years. We're getting close to eliminating that also. We have uh, 127 bushel proven dryland corn yield. County average is under 100. So we're over 25% higher than county average without all the, the costs involved. We're saving a tremendous amount of inputs. Our cost to produce a bushel of corn last year was $1.42. That included all the land costs, uh, planting it, harvesting it, trucking it to market, everything. It's made least cost producers out of us. It's about the system and it's about thinking holistically. We're not in this to make the most profit this year. We're in it to regenerate our soils and long-term profitability. And because we've gone to this type of a production model, we're able to produce our cash commodities at a fraction of the cost. My family's been farming corn and soybeans here for five generations. Uh, we plant about 3,000 acres and it's all no-till and we cover crop the whole farm every year. We use almost exclusively cereal rye on the farm here because we have harsh winters in Iowa and cereal rye is the cover crop that will survive virtually any winter and come through the spring uh, very healthy. We tend to get uh, wet springs here and the cereal rye helps the water filtration rates and it also helps evaporate some of that water so it's in a way a replacement for some of the drainage tile that we have in Iowa. And we see cover crops as, as part of our integrated pest management as well so you know cover cropping is part of keeping a, a healthy ecosystem where the cover crops are useful for keeping weeds down, keeping beneficial insects and, and uh, so, soil microbial activity in the soil 
Um, and so it requires ultimately a lot less chemical to farm. Our yields here typically are 20 to 30 percent above the rest of the county and we would attribute a lot of that to the uh, long-term effects of having a cover crop. I took on a new field last year um, and it was across the fence front field that I had been farming for 10 years. Um, in year one, the yields were uh, less than half of the field that we had been farming for long term. And, and already in the second year, after planting a cover crop and no tilling, uh, we've closed the gap. Well, one of the things that I've started to see in the last few years is that uh, landowners have come to me asking me to rent their farms because they see that uh, we're cover cropping, we're using good stewardship on our farms, and, and they want to protect the long-term value on their farm. In addition to farming here in Iowa, I also uh, run an investment group that buys farmland nationally. And as we go out to different farms and take an inventory of the soil, the way that the land has been treated can make an enormous difference on our estimate of the productivity. In some, some cases, a 100% difference in the value. So cover crops help us as we manage both our farm in Iowa and our portfolio nationally to help preserve the value of the soil uh, instead of having uh, many, many tons of soil loss every year. Uh, we generally don't have any soil loss. Um, we're actually building organic matter in the soil and that's really important uh, for long-term land value. Well, good, good morning again. Uh, my name is Alan Weber. I farm in Mid-Missouri, crop and livestock farm there. I happen to think that I've probably got the best job on today's program because I next get to chat with these gentlemen for 30 or 40 minutes, and we all get to learn and, and listen to the years of experience that they have. I say listen, but I know from talking with them beforehand that they're most interested in making sure that they're addressing the questions and topics that are significant to you. So we already actually have quite a few topics and questions from the first panel. I was impressed with the questions that you asked, but for our audience here in Omaha, if you do have a specific question as we're going through and you want to ask it to an individual panel member or to the panel at large, please go ahead and write those down and there will be individuals circulating again and uh, they'll pull those from you. So, so anyway, gentlemen, welcome. Glad to, glad to have you. And, I actually had a chance to see your videos ahead of time, and, and uh, I enjoy watching them each and every time. And particularly, Dan, yours, um, I thought that whenever you said, I have that, uh, that aha moment, I could almost see the little light bulb you know, going off, and you sitting there in the pit digging that tile. So tell us a little bit more about when you started using cover crops, and maybe from that aha moment to have things changed in terms of your strategies on your farm, or, or are they still fairly similar? Sure. Um, first, I'd like to say that it's uh, both humbling and an honor to be up here with these gentlemen and, and the, the brain power that's in this room uh, is phenomenal. I'd just like to thank all the people that work to bring everybody here today because we're all going to go away smarter and better because of it. But as to the aha moment, I guess uh, to give it some context, you need to know two things. One, I was trained as a financial analyst, not an agronomist, and two, um, we had just spent the prior 10 years uh, transitioning all our farms to no-till system. And as part of that transition, we had been coached and led to believe that, uh, that getting, getting rid of compaction was one of the keys to a successful transition. Um, I can't tell you how many hours we spent with a no-till ripper. Uh, I now realize how much of an oxymoron that is. but. Uh, pulling the guts out of a 4440, attempting to take out compaction layers as deep as maybe 12 inches. And that was in fields where things were good. Uh, so all of a sudden now I'm in this pit and this cover crop that I'd been told to plant and how to do it and whatnot that I really wasn't paying a lot of attention to, there's roots four feet deep. And um, the light bulbs went on and I thought, you know, um, look at the effort we've gone to to try to eliminate compaction, and we have not accomplished one one thousandth of what we just did with a few dollars worth of ryegrass seed and four months or uh, you know between time between cash crops, and so that started the wheels in motion, um, starting to think about how nature does things and to mimic nature and 
And so many farmers, and I was guilty, uh, look at things from a physical and a chemical perspective. Uh, I guess the, the really exciting thing that came out of this was not only appreciating the physical characteristics of what had just occurred, but also to start thinking about another dimension, which is the biological. And it's something that, that I had no training in, and I, and I really believe that 98% of the farmers out there today have little to no appreciation of. And when I start to understand and appreciate that and see all that can be gained in terms of productivity and, and, and reduced input costs, I really uh, I can't say how much I admire guys like these two sitting next to me here that have been at the forefront of that. We're trying to catch up with that, but that's, that's the exciting part of the aha moment is that it's led to a whole new way that we think about the soil. So Dave or, or Gabe, was it similar for you? Did the light bulb click or was it one of those things that gradually you moved into using cover crops? Well, I guess we began uh, mainly because we had to. Uh, we started in uh, 71 no-tilling and 78 with covers uh, and uh, began using single species and uh, realized that that was a way we could reduce uh, some input costs. Uh, we began as a early pioneers, so we actually didn't qualify for any programs that was ever introduced because we were innovators in that situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we on our farm, my wife and I didn't believe in crop insurance, so we just kept trying to improve our soils and doing things that way. And uh, I guess my aha moment was uh, when we learned that we could take two different species through a precision planter and make it work, and then uh, four years ago learning that we could use uh, as many as 8 and 12 and 15 to improve the soil rapidly and uh, reduce our inputs. Excellent. You know, and Gabe, that's one of the things that impressed me whenever I was watching your video. Uh, I have a lot of friends that uh, I've talked to about cover crops and usually the first thing that they say is, yeah, but there's $40 an acre that I have to do something with. But yet, when I watch your video, what drove home the message to me is that cover crops actually made you a lower cost producer. And I thought that was what is, was impressive. So let us know more about kind of your strategies. Well, one of the things that, that we've really learned over time is that we've accepted a degraded resource. Agriculture today is farming degraded resources. My resources are still degraded. And how do we regenerate them? The best way is to mimic nature. And you look at nature, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. You know, one of our native rangeland pastures my son, who teaches range management at the local college, brought his class out and they counted over 140 different species of grasses, forbs, and legumes in this pasture. If that's the way our soils were developed, why don't we have that diversity today? So what we've attempted to mimic over time is we've diversified our cash crops. We now, we now farm a myriad of different cash crops. And our, on our 2,000 acres of cropland, as was discussed in the video, we have cover crops growing on all 2,000 of those acres, either before a cash crop, after a cash crop, or along with the cash crop. So we're trying to mimic nature. And then the last step we've brought in is the livestock component. We try to get livestock on all of our acres every year because we've found we can regenerate the soils faster with livestock. And if you look at how soils were formed over eons of time, this is nothing new that we're doing here. Nature has the template for eons of time. We just need to, as producers, to follow that template. So we've added that dimension and now we've been able to regenerate our soils and it's made us the least cost producer. Which is excellent. And you mentioned degraded resources and Clay, I'd like to switch over to you because you're in Iowa where you've got a CSR rating and there's a lot of time land changes hands based upon that CSR rating. I know there's a couple of states that have similar but I know you have some really interesting thoughts as it pertains to land value and degradation and how that factors into to your operation. Yeah, the way, <clears throat> my father and I are both engineers and, and one of the approaches that we've always had to our farm is, is to test every aspect of what we do for sufficiency. I like the word Ray uh, used, sufficiency, earlier in talking about uh, no-till not being sufficient for, for erosion protection anymore. And so we've looked at, you know, uh, row by row measurements, doing thousands of comparisons, plant by plant measurements, doing thousands of comparisons, and also at a field level and, and looking at, at everything we do and is it sufficient to achieve what we need to. And so we're, we're really not looking for an incremental gain, but looking for, um, you know, how can we get to a point where 
we are sufficient with our erosion control. And so that's, that's affected our choice of, of cover crop. When we look at the CSR rating, as, as you referred to, what's interesting about that is that it's, it's static. It's based on, on uh, soil surveys that were generally done a generation ago, uh, or productivity in, indices like we see in Illinois and the Dakotas and some other states. Um, and so there isn't really an, an incentive for, for landowners who have, who have a certain CSR rating um, uh, to protect soil if that rating's not going to change. Uh, when they sell the land, um, that land will sell on dollars per CSR point or dollars per PI point. And there's no other physical asset we see traded that way. We, people wouldn't buy a classic car based on how it came out of the factory or buy a, a house that was built in the 50s based on the condition it was back then. But farmland is still traded that way. And I think that's a, when I was talking beforehand to Clay, I mean, that was one of the points that, that really drove home to me. And I think that that's one that we can take away from the panel today is, is just going to the, the graded resources and then the ways that we can, we can move forward. Dan, I'm gonna move right to questions from the, from the group. We have a number of them. It says, uh, Dan, you mentioned a negative experience with cover crops. What was that? And uh, what do you think caused it? Well, uh, my father uh, was more of a pioneer than I and that he started ridge till back before Roundup and a lot of the tools that we take for granted today were really available or affordable and, and, and Cyril Rye was um, his attempt back in probably the early to mid 80s. Um, I was away in college I think when some of this was going on so I don't have intimate knowledge of it but uh, I think army worms were a big factor. Uh, the ability to get things managed and sprayed, he, he, you know, a lot of the battle was lost before he could mobilize to take that on. And also, they didn't have the tools to terminate that, that we have today. Um, so it was a combination of those two things, really. And just not having the knowledge that we have today about what we need to pre be prepared to manage if we're going to have cover crops. Dave, you mentioned earlier um, the fact that you don't take crop insurance. And um, I've got a number of questions, and I'll, I'll probably try to read them all. Um, so they, they, well, they, there's, there's several, they, they kind of go together. Um, the, the, one I, the one I like is, is that my banker really likes me to have crop insurance. <laughs> and then it says, crop insurance and cover crops, question mark. And this is for everybody, so everybody please jump in. Um, why not give a discount on crop insurance if a cover crop is used? Um, how do we address the issue of risk management, i.e. crop insurance, not reacting with policy changes fast enough to keep up with the agronomic changes? with the evolving application of cover crops? And should all barriers, i.e. crop insurance, to grazing cover crops be eliminated? So I think each of you probably has your own unique perspective on that. And uh, <coughs> dive in, anybody that wants to go first. <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, uh, RMA's come a long way in the last uh, 24 months. Uh, there's been a, they've done a lot of great things. Uh, uh, a lot of people has went to RMA and talked about how uh, we have not seen a uh, crop loss uh, from uh, uh, water being pulled away from, with the cover crops or anything like that. That seemed to be a, a false consumption of, you know, if you have a cover crop, it's going to suck all the water away for the, the host crop, uh, you know. And uh, I think, you know, we are making baby steps towards getting the things we need to do. Uh, and I think uh, as far as a lot of bankers influenced or influenced with having crop insurance because they have that protection. But I think the same thing, the farmers tend to run on the uh, opposite that they have that protection. So why do I need to make a management decision uh, if I'm having a problem with my crop? You know, I'm guaranteed this return on my investment and uh, it might not be as much as producing a crop, but I'm covered, you know. And I guess in our situation, we didn't have that luxury. so. If the corn's not looking good, we got to go out and figure out why and what do we need to do with it, or is there something else we could plant if the hail storm come and took it out? And you know, you have to look at outside the norms uh, when you're not using uh, uh, an umbrella to cover your expenses. Mm -hmm. And Gabe, I know that you've worked really hard to integrate your livestock operation with cover crops, and there was a question about crop insurance and grazing. Yep. Well. One of the things, I, I really commend RMA and NRCS for coming together and working along with FSA. You know, we have a lot of brilliant scientists out here. Dr. Haney, Dr. Clapperton, Dr. Beck, Dr. Chris Nichols. You know, there, there's a tremendous number of brilliant scientists out here. Why not get them together with RMA, FSA, NRCS, and sort this out? Now, in saying that, 
I too, like David, no longer partake in crop insurance because we've been able to build enough resiliency into our soils that it's no longer needed. And I look at our livestock component as my insurance policy. If that hailstorm comes through, and trust me, those of you who know my story know that I lost four crops in a row to hail and drought. I know what a hailstorm can do, but it's the livestock component then that can come in and turn that cover crop or that cash crop into dollars. It's all about resiliency, though. Yeah. Still a little bit on the go ahead, Clint. Yeah, just on the crop insurance. We've heard from uh, from Howard how he's able to save some money uh, in cover cropping and some of the farmers here, and I think that's really exceptional as we look at an aggregate level. Uh, based on information we heard earlier today, we figure thirty to fifty dollars for or increased cost um, that's overcome with increased yield. One of the important financial characteristics that we look at is um, net cash returns to farmland versus versus the the price of grain, and when you increase yield. Uh, compared to land value, you, you increase the slope and your, your cost per acre uh, shifts that, that entire line up and down. So we, we bring the line down because our costs are higher, but then we, we make it steeper. We get a little bit more leveraged, uh, essentially, on, on the price of grain. And so uh, when grain prices go down or when we have a crop failure without crop insurance, we're, we're worse off if our costs are higher. And, and so uh, it's important that, uh, that when we're looking at a, at a farm level and not just an aggregate level, we're aware of what that does in an individual year to a farmer and his risk profile. And crop insurance is critical for, for covering during that time. Um, you know, as we, look at, um, as we look at yield volatility on a field level, uh, uh, it, only, it only reduces by 9% as we go to a, a farm level, um, according to the uh, uh, USDA uh, Economic Research Service, and 56% as we get to a county level. So farm level yield variability, um, which Gabe can attest to, is a lot higher than county level uh, because of, of hail events and things like this that are localized. So crop insurance, as we increase the cost of cropping, is critical for, for covering that gap. So Clay, what have you, earlier we made a mistake because we, uh, we spoke in acronyms and we talked about CSR ratings, CSR 1 and 2 in Iowa. Could you please explain that as it relates to land value and, then, and build on that, and Dan, if you could jump in as well. Um, one of the questions that, that I get from uh, some of my friends that are farming in different areas is, is that, yeah, but I rent a lot from people and my landlords wouldn't get it. So, and this can go to anybody in terms of the panel, but uh, after you explain CSR, if you could talk about, have you ever had any pushback from landlords that you may have in terms of the use of cover crops? And if you did, what'd you have to do to explain to them the values, or did you have to show it to them? So first the CSR, so that some of our live stream groups yeah, were so, saying. So, so in Iowa, CSR is the corn suitability rating. It's a, it's, it's a number from five to 100 that's a measure of the quality of the land. And it is, uh, it's based on uh, soil type and slope. And so it would be similar to the productivity index, also based off of soil type and slopes that are, are common in other states. And so, from any of the landlords that you've worked with, did you ever get any pushback from a landlord? And, and if you did, what did you have to do or what kind of messaging did you use? Well, we, you know, our landlords are, uh, uh, are an interesting group because we have some, uh, some uh, elderly landlords and then we have landlords that's just recently inherited the farms. And it seems like that uh, the generation of the 30 to 40 year olds that's just inherited the farms are more concerned about how we are protecting the soil and doing things. And uh, the older farmers that we work with, uh, as we go to them and tell them that we are gonna leave the soil in better shape than we have started with, uh, that seems to be a resonance they like. And as we do these covers and they're green going into winter, it's surprising how many other landlords are calling us and say, do you have time to do that for us? You know, And we can only farm so many acres. You know, yep. uh, We just can't do it all. So, uh, but you'll try? Or? Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll select a few. You know, you know but. The, the easiest way uh, with the landlords is if, uh, if they don't like what I'm doing, I just get new landlords, <laughs> plain and simple. Yeah. But I want to address one other thing as far as crop insurance is concerned. This could all be solved easily if crop insurance premiums were tied to soil loss. Yes. That, that would solve a lot of it. Yeah. We have the data and the scientists to be able to work with RMA and do this. Right. Just tie premiums to soil loss, 
would reach 20 million of acres of cover crops just like that. Yep. Yep. So, so I, there we go. Yeah. So I'm not sure if Gabe was trying to do that on purpose for me or not, but it's a great segue to basically announce that really this is what we'll be doing tomorrow in our breakout session is, is tackling some of these issues and then coming up with the programs, the policies, or the changes which are necessary to get us going there. So that was a perfect example and, and I appreciate it. How about the rest of you? Any other experiences in terms of any of your tenants or your landlord situations? Um, if anything, we've received re what I'd call reverse pushback yeah. and that uh, we have an expectation that we've created on the part of our landlords now that cover crops will get there and if for some reason due to weather or harvest timing or for whatever reason we don't get it done, I'm much more apt to hear about that than uh, hearing about, you know, why are you doing this. We, we've spent a lot of time trying to educate the people we work with and probably the reason we work with, I have some great people that I work with because they understand and appreciate the way that we're trying to improve their farms. and. We tell them when we start with them uh, right up front that um, the only way we'll do this is if we can manage your farm like it was our own. And, and they seem to be appreciative of that. I, you know, I think the other thing that I like to add to that is that you know, we have conventional farmers that's talking to our landlords and offering them a lot more money. And they say, you know, so the last couple of years I've always said, well, look how ugly that 10 way blend is, you know. And for three years we've been throwing in about a pound of sunflowers. And of course they bloom in the fall and they looking great and they got beautiful colors and those landlords really get excited about seeing those flowers <laughs> out in the field. So that's really helped us, you know. It's wonderful for a marriage also. Yeah. <laughs> Take her a bouquet every day. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's stick with the concept of, um, of having ideas or concepts that, that will help us move forward in terms of the adoption of cover crops or the increased acreage. And one of the folks um, asked, since the goal is a tenfold increase in cover crops, so moving from, from two to 20 million acres in the next six years, do you think that we will have enough seed and will it be affordable? And, and I, I'm surprised. I mean, I, I didn't think we'd stump any of them. <laughs> uh, that, that's not going to be an issue. Right. Because look what happened during CRP with grass seed production, you know, with the large enrollment in CRP. The amount of profit to be made selling cover crop seed will be tremendous. And I tend to agree with Gabe on that because, you know, uh, two years ago it was tough to find cereal rye. And uh, presently I think there's cereal rye sitting in about every other farmstead that's growing cover crops yeah. because the price got high enough that now we leave five acres or ten acres and we harvest the rye and, and reuse it on our own operations, yeah. you know. Uh, but I think, you know, to get that, that large increase, we've got to get our producers uh, uh, in tune with how to uh, improve their soils and why is it important to improve them. Uh, and uh, I think that'll be the big thing that we'll have to accomplish is getting them out of the uh, mindset that they're doing everything fairly well okay. Yep. You know, David and I have, David's been doing this a lot longer. He was one of my idols when I first started and one of my mentors that I really looked at. But I remember back in 1995 when I locked, walked into my local elevator and I asked for a thousand pounds of turnip seed, and they were trying to figure out how many garden packets was a thousand pounds. <laughs> That's no longer an issue. That same local elevator had last summer fill, uh, filled and emptied their warehouse two and a half times with right. cover crop seed. Yep. Yep. So, Dan or Clay, uh, what is the biggest challenge that, from your perspective that farmers face whenever they transition over to a cover crop? And the, the you know what, I think, I think uh, I'd flip it and say what really facilitated it for me was NRCS programs. So that made it very easy. As I talk about the importance of cost and how that really, um, really is important over the, the short term, um, you know, having uh, uh, the CSP program, having the Equip program has been, has been makes it an absolute no-brainer. Um, so, so, so that's been really useful. The absence of those programs would, would, would create a challenge. I think funding really helps um, getting that started. Um, you know, I think from, from an equipment standpoint, uh, in a corn-soybean rotation, we're using the same seeding equipment um, as, as what we use for seeding soybeans, and, and we already have incentive to, to have uh, capacity to be able to seed soybeans fast, so that's very well matched um, with, the, with the cover crops. Uh, when we first started seeding, um, 
uh, like a lot of our neighbors, we're, we'd be using sometimes Roundup for burn down, and uh, switching to Gramoxone really helped. Instead of sitting there and sweating and wetting, you know, when is it going to die? Uh, we can, it, it allows us also to have a lot more confidence to, to take it a lot further. So we'll, you know, I may go all the way until uh, the day of soybean seeding to, uh, to kill off the, the ryegrass. You, you'd never wait till say, the day or two after you seed it, though, right? Yeah, sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> we just won't tell anybody, right? <laughs> so that, that's great, though. So that's a great transition, Clay, in, ter in terms of uh, you know, cover crop seeding and techniques. Dan, I know you've tried a number of different I, things. I think the biggest challenge in a word is time, mm -hmm. and both in terms of physically getting the job done, but more so in terms of um, the growing season and what we can accomplish with the growing season that we have. And uh, we've tried different things and, and we've all had our successes and failures. We tend to drill most of ours just because that is proven to be the most reliable, but we really need to get beyond that. If we're gonna get to 20 million acres, you know, you know the thing we're really interested in looking at is companion cover crops, living covers, you know, anything that will help us get that crop started. So as soon as the crop comes off and the canopy's open, it's off and running. And that, that is probably the hardest thing. That, that would also shift some of the time that we have to spend during harvest, which is our peak labor period. Uh, we could be seeding and doing some of these things in other off peak or less peak times. That would help a lot too. Well, I think that's why we looked at the high boy seeder because I think we can work with a corn and bean producer that doesn't really have wheat in their rotation and don't want to have wheat in their rotation and be out there uh, five to six weeks ahead of harvest. You know, uh, uh, we had two farmers last year that we talked to and what they did, they put uh, earlier season corn around the perimeter of the farm so they could take that off like two weeks before the rest of the corn was ripe and it left us an avenue to go in with the high boy seeder so we didn't run over the end rows and do that seeding and that was a great thing because they got to adjust their equipment ahead, they got their dryers to figure out and I think some of the big things that we used to fight was always how much seed do you use and you know uh, a cover crop is a cover crop it doesn't need to be as thick and it doesn't need to be you're not harvesting it for a seed crop mm -hmm. uh, and I think in, our, in Ohio and, and for example with our wet cold soils lower seeding rates seems to work better than higher rates, and the equipment goes through it a lot better, you know. And I, 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 we found that seems to help to tell farmers, you know. Let me, let me capitalize on a comment that Dan made and kind of combine it in terms of, you, you mentioned time at harvest as being one of those things that you have to deal with and the fact that maybe we're not quite there yet. So is, is that a potential area where we need some more work in terms of the, on the seeding side of the equation? Okay. One of the things I think that it's available to all of us producers that we're not taking advantage of with the current production model is mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. And you look at the, the benefits that can be had from growing multi-species together, that's why the current production model of monocultures makes no sense. It doesn't. We can increase production by planting multi-species together, take advantage of mycorrhizal fun fungi and all the benefits that we can receive from them. You know? But we need to get beyond when and what time to seed and seed it together, take advantage of what nature has to offer in a truly biological system. Then we'll increase production substantially. So Gabe, you might be the best person to answer this. Uh, this, this individual is basically saying that we spent a lot of time talking about corn and soybean rotations. Uh, can you talk about other rotations that include wheat or other crops and how cover crops integrate? As I said earlier, we integrate cover crops into all of our cash crops. We grow corn, we grow spring wheat, we grow triticale, we grow peas, we grow sunflowers, we grow hairy vetch. We have a myriad of different cash crops. There's cover crops in all of them. For, last, for instance, last year we had a sunflower field with over 20 different species of covers growing in with it. This is easy to do, you just need to ignore RMA and think about the resiliency. <laughs> think about the resiliency you're building in your system. Then you can do without RMA. You know, I spend a lot of my time speaking out in the Corn Belt, and the one thing I hear is, well, we grow corns and soybeans. And I said, well, why don't you try other crops? Well, we don't have a market for them. And I said, well, doesn't your semi have tires? You know, <laughs> you can transfer crops, you know, long distances. You need to expand your, your thought process. Well, and I think uh, uh, producers that have uh, uh, a three-tiered cropping system, corn, beans, and wheat, 
the ideal time is to, to utilize that time after wheat harvest till uh, snow flies to really have your diversity in cover crops that's really going to mimic Mother Nature, you know, because you've got that time frame there to get it done. And, you know, everybody seems to think this cover crop thing is difficult. Well, you just, you get somebody to put on a tractor that's not going to run through the fences. And if he has a, a, a rabbit run through the field every now and then, that's not too big a deal. You know, it's not like you're going to harvest this crop. Just get it out there. That's the problem. You've got to get it out there. You know, and rye is the most forgiving crop. I mean, it can go from from uh, July clear through uh, November, and it'll still show up in the spring. You know, and, and that's what I like about what we can do. So, and Clay, well, actually, go ahead, Dave. Well, I was just going to say because of the research and, and the experiences of others, we're actually in an area that doesn't grow much wheat. Um, we've always grown some because we need a place for manure to go in the summertime, but. We're actually going to try to bring back wheat as more of a stable part of our rotation because of the opportunity that it does afford us to do a multi-special type uh, cover. And, and the benefits that we think we will see from that in the subsequent crops, um, if we bring that profit back and assign it to the wheat enterprise, uh, all of a sudden it, it looks a lot better in comparison to corn and beans. Clay, there's a couple of questions for you uh, relating to cereal rye, in terms of your use with cereal rye, and whether or not you've seen any allelopathic effects from the cereal rye in corn. And uh, you've already answered their other question, which is when do you typically terminate your cover crop? And the other follow-up question is whether or not you're planting any covers into your soybean stubble. Yeah, so uh, we'll generally use cereal rye everywhere. And um, we will kill it off earlier uh, in, in before a corn crop than soybean crop. So it, it, what, what I tend to hear is that the little pathic effects tend to be greater as the, the rye gets more mature. That's kind of the perception. I think a little more work needs to be done on that. So we'll kill that off earlier in the spring. How about for any of you uh, in terms of there was a question as to how you get or where you're getting most of your information in terms of cover crops. And by this time, you're probably the educators. You're the you're the leveragers that are out there giving information, but when you started and how do you think that's changed in terms of where there's really good, high quality sources for information on cover crops? Well, I hope that nobody gets into the air handling system in this room because most of the people that I've gotten the best information from on this are in this room today. If something happens, <laughs> so we're, you're, we're you're gonna make sure they all take different planes home, right? So that nobody's on the same plane. If, uh, just university extension is what I trust for everything. You know, in, in, in the United States industry, agribusinesses have a control of a huge amount of the information flow that goes to farmers. And, and uh, you know, we'd be a lot better served if, if extension had, you know, more funding and could be a greater percentage of that. Um, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's unbiased and trustworthy and there's, there's a lot of great work done that, that's really from a farmer perspective and really understands the, uh, the drive for profitability. So I'll, uh, all, the, all the university extensions are really valuable to me. Well, I think in, our, in my case, it's just been able to go to these kind of, of meetings, to fellowship with other producers, find out what they're doing, and hoping that I can take one thing home and adapt it to our operation uh, wherever I go. Uh, you know, I do a, a fair amount of speaking like Gabe, and I think I learn more when I talk to other people than what I try to present. And uh, you have to go to these kind of meetings with an open mind and see what you can learn. And I'm really excited in the last five or six years with how much uh, 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 universities, especially land grant universities, is starting to come on board with things to help us. You know, uh, and I think the reason they didn't help us, they didn't know that we needed help. You know, and uh, it seems like when you go to a professor and you ask him if he can give you some information, they're willing to spend time with you. But they're not going to go out of their way if you don't have any money, but they will answer your questions, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah. that's been a big thing because, uh, uh, you know, it's different on a, a five acre or a five foot square pad in a research facility versus a 20 or a 30 or 100 acre field, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, and one of the most important things uh, on our operation, my son and I, we try and fail at something every year. Yeah. We want to fail at something every year because yeah. if we don't fail at something, how, how are we going to know there isn't something better out there? You'll, so you'll make get, your learning experiences small. 
but don't be afraid to fail. You'll get better in time. We fail without even trying. <laughs> At least once a year. <laughs> Oh, I'll tell you what, the, the, the questions keep going. We're going to run out of time, and we're not going to get through, the, through all the good ones. Um, this question was whether or not, um, do you think we can change policies to help make this movement a success? Now, I realize we've already talked a little bit about crop insurance. We've touched briefly, Clay, you mentioned on the incentive side about how you felt like that, that was important. Beyond those two, are there any other areas of policy that you feel like would change the momentum here in terms of cover crops? And, and maybe it's not, but that was just that was a great question. Well, I'm going to address something that hasn't been discussed that, that's not policy. But I think if we really want to drive to 20 million acres, one of the things we have to do is educate consumers. Right. And you look at the nutrient density of the foods that we're producing, it's dropped precipitously the past 40, 50 years. We're producing more food, but it's less nutrient dense. Mm -hmm. If we start using food as medicine, as preventative medicine, the consumers will drive change because in order to get nutrient-dense foods, you have to have biologically healthy soils. Yep. So uh, we know from Gabe's video that, um, that you've seen a significant decrease in terms of the use of chemicals on, on your operation. So this question was actually addressed to the other three members of our panel as to the impacts that they feel like that they've seen, you've seen from your cover crop use in terms of either pest cycles or in terms of your use of herbicides? Well, as we've grown the mulch level at the surface, I mean, what's the first thing you do when you plant a tree? You mulch it. I mean, what do people, you know, that are really into gardening do to prevent? We're doing this on a field-wide field -wide basis. And as you grow that mulch, uh, the weed pressure goes, diminishes rapidly. And uh, there's no question that, I would say on average, we're spending half of what a, a typical herbicide budget in our part of the world would be because of our no-till and cover cropping practices, maybe less. Well, I feel in our operation, uh, mainly because as we, you know, we're picking up new land every year, so we're, we'll probably never be to the point that we don't do without commercial fertilizer or some herbicides to use because we don't have that farm in the situation because it's usually pretty well degraded, so we got to build it. Uh, but over 50% of our acres on our 1,200 acres no longer get fungicides, insecticides, uh, herbicides, and very little starter fertilizers. And we've reduced the nitrogen clear down to a quarter of what we normally use. Excellent. So we're down just to the last couple of questions here. Uh, we've talked a lot about cereal rye, annual rye grass, things like that. Can, can anybody talk about the use of or the role of legume cover crops uh, into your rotation? Oh, you? I'd love to address that one. <laughs> it, it blows my mind. One of the ways, you know, we have another motto on our operation. We want to sign the back of the check and not the front. <laughs> you know, and one of the easiest ways to do that is with nitrogen fertilizer. You know, there's thousands of tons of nitrogen in the atmosphere. How do we convert that into usable forms for us on our operation? It's through the use of legumes. We grow a tremendous amount of legumes. For example, you know, our corn has hairy vetch and clover growing with it all season long. That supplies our nitrogen. We haven't used synthetic fertilizer since 2008. We don't have to. It's free if we get to a biological type system. And we've changed ours and uh, with, you know, behind our wheat we're using uh, four to five different legumes. Uh, the last two years, we've been doing interseeding with uh, soybeans between the corn rows and reduced the nitrogen requirements by as much as 75%, allowing the soybean to grow nutrient or growing the nitrogen that the corn needs, you know? And uh, that was an interesting scenario because I was helping VOAG kids. We have two VOAG farms that I furnish equipment and, and information for. And, one of the fellows, one of the young men come to me and he says, Mr. Brandt, why don't we use cover crops in our boag pot? And I says, well, your teacher won't let us. You know, he, don't have, he says, we don't have time to establish them. And he says, well, what do you think about planting soybeans between the rows, you know? And I just kind of turned around and walked back towards the corn planter and he caught me and he says, is there something wrong? And I said, yeah, I'm just upset I didn't think about that. You know? <laughs> but, uh, 
<laughs> you know, we tried it for three years, and uh, you know, without fertilizer, three years ago, uh, the cornfield made 140 bushel corn, and with 140 pounds of nitrogen, it made 125 bushel corn. So at that point, you know, we're up as high as 50% of our corn acres has uh, soybeans growing in between the rows. You know, perfect. Last question, because we're, we're down just a, a couple of minutes left, and for, um, for the rest of the audience here in Omaha, tomorrow you're going to have a chance to be able to provide input and suggestions, and for all the forum locations out there, uh, you're going to have a local discussion immediately after the live stream, and we'll be asking you to come up with game changers. So basically uh, an activity or an event that addresses an issue that can have a significant impact in terms of increasing the use of cover crops. And so I'm going to ask each of, each of you quickly to give what you consider to be a number one game changer that we need to address, and anybody can, can start. One thing that we've gotten very good at in our operation is taking in an inventory of the soil. So we use uh, probes to take deep cores, similar scientific equipment to what uh, uh, NRCS or universities would use, uh, but it's, it's expensive and time consuming. One thing that we don't have is a way to measure every single year what the, what the soil movements and losses are on a farm. And if there's a technology, a nanotechnology or some kind of tracer or something else that actually allowed to measure that, we, so we can take an inventory of the soil kind of once and rarely, uh, infrequently. And we also have good models for kind of estimating soil loss, but I don't think either of those quite give the incentive, quite the drive um, that we would have if we could measure um, you know, on an annual basis very cheaply what the actual soil movements are. I think that would be a tremendous driver. So we got 30 seconds. Can you guys boom, think, boom, boom? I think we need to focus resources on land owner education, both within the farming public and, and, and non-resident landlords to where they understand the value of biologically active soils and organic matter and all the things we're talking about enhancing here and why it puts more money in their pocket, uh, makes their investment worth more. And that's the most direct way to influence farmers is through landowners. Education, technology. I think one of the, the game changers is going to be the Haney test developed by Dr. Rick Haney. Yep. That test will revolutionize the way we test soils in this country. Soil health. And I, I would have to go with that because we've used the Savita test in Rick's labs and it's just, uh, it's just made complete uh, changes in our fertilization program. Perfect. Thank you, Dave, and thank you to each of you for, uh, for all the help and insights that, that you've provided to, uh, to everybody here. I would say also thank you to the audience here in Omaha, and I want to make sure that I reach out and say thank you to all the forum locations that are participating today across the country. We're very interested in making sure that we get your input as well, so please, if you could, start offering those suggestions. We're about to end the live stream portion of the broadcast, so facilitators, if you could provide that information, type it into the SWCS website link that you were provided. And for that, I do appreciate and say thank you very much.